Welcome to Magnificat.tv news program dedicated to providing news from the church. It is Wednesday, May 31st, and these are our headlines. The Pope has modified the Vatican Constitution, which had been enforced since 2000, by introducing lay people into the governing bodies. The Prefect of the Doctrine of Faith, Cardinal Ladaria, has defended the validity of the encyclical Humanae Vitae because of its opposition to gender ideology. A leading member of the German Synod has announced his apostasy from the Church, disappointed that the changes he had been promised were not approved. The Bishop of Antwerp insisted that the Pope has twice given him permission to bless homosexual couples, although the Church forbids it. Dr. Roback, founder of the association Ruth, which aims to help victims of the sexual revolution, has reminded that there is not such a thing as a homosexual gene. The new constitution approved by the Pope for the Vatican State will allow lay people to be part of the decision-making bodies. The Pope has promulgated a new fundamental law for the Vatican State, which replaces that of the year 2000. Among other things, it expands the Pontifical Commission, which will now consist not only of cardinals, lay people will also be able to participate. As in the 2000 Constitution, the Pope confirms the fullness of the power of governance of the Supreme Pontiff, which includes legislative, executive, and judicial power. He also confirms the singular particularity and autonomy of the Vatican Judicial Order, distinct from that of the Roman Curia, and it confirms the jurisdiction of the state over extraterrestrial areas. The Pope also confirms the legislative function of the Pontifical Commission, until now composed of a cardinal president and other cardinals. With the new fundamental law, in addition to the cardinals, the Commission will have other members, including lay people appointed by the Pope for a five-year term of office. The Pontifical Commission relies on the collaboration of the government's legal office, experts, and the councillors of state to prepare the relevant drafts. With regard to the latter, a novelty introduced by the law is the creation of a special college of state councillors. Cardinal Ladaria, Jesuit and Prefect of the Doctrine of Faith, defended the validity of the encyclical Humanae Vitae for its opposition to gender ideology. Cardinal Ladaria, Prefect of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, gave a conference at the meeting on the encyclical Humanae Vitae, promoted in Rome by the Jerome Lejeune International Chair of Bioethics. The Cardinal recalled that the doctrine of this encyclical cannot change. Cardinal Aderia recalled that the encyclical Humanae Vitae addressed the questions of sexuality, love, and life, which are intimately interrelated. For this reason, its message remains relevant and topical even today. Benedict XVI expressed it in these words. What was true yesterday remains true today. The truth expressed in Humanae Vitae does not change. Rejecting the encyclical means not only accepting the morality of contraception, but also accepting the dualistic anthropology which sees nature as a threat to freedom and which believes that by manipulating the body, one can change the conditions of truth of the conjugal act. This reification of the body not only leads to the loss of the truth of human love and the family, but has caused an alarming decrease in births and a multiplication in the number of abortions. The rejection of the indissolubility of the two meanings, which proclaimed the regulation of births through the use of contraceptives, has evolved into the artificial manipulation of the transmission of life through assisted reproduction techniques. First, sexuality without children was accepted. 
Then it was accepted to produce children without sexual intercourse. The life produced is no longer considered in itself as a gift but as a product and is now evaluated in terms of utility. This utility is now called equality of life. Quality of life thus becomes a discriminatory concept between lives worthy of being lived and lives unworthy of being lived and which can therefore be suppressed. All this is softened by a certain compassion for the people in these situations, compassion for their relatives and for a society that will be spared unnecessary expenses. A leading member of the German Sinner has officially left the church in protest at the failure to pass what he and the majority intended to achieve. Lucas Faber a member of the German Synodal Assembly, until its conclusion in March, has left the Catholic Church, making his apostasy official. Faber made the announcement on his social media. He claimed that the reformed project had been a powerless experience for him, despite all the encouraging experiences and alliances which were able to forge. Faber said that he became increasingly aware that the official church could hardly be reformed. I kept asking myself whether membership in this official church was still compatible with many Christian moral conception. The apostate explains that he fought for reforms in the church with many other wonderful and inspiring Catholics in the synodal way and in the associations. We were united by the unrealistic goal of dismantling the systemic causes of sexualized violence. In the end, there were a few good texts, too many soft compromises, rather, capitulations, and above all, no compromise at all. Fabel belonged to the group of participants under 30 years of age at the Synodal Assembly and had been nominated by the Central Committee of German Catholics. Last year, Febel was also involved in the Out in Church campaign. About 125 church employees and members declared themselves queer, that is, homosexual and transgender, and also spoke out in favor of reforms in the church. Febel declared that he wanted to remain involved in the church as a Christian despite his apostasy. He also stressed that he could continue to work full of conviction, full-time for the German Catholic Youth Federation in the Diocese of Munster. Faber works for the Diocesan Association as a consultant for the youth organization's 72-hour campaign planned for next year. The chairman of the association, Felix Elbers, declared that Faber is and will remain responsible for the 72-hour campaign. The Bishop of Antwerp, Monsignor Bunny, has again declared that in Belgium they bless same-sex couples with the explicit permission from the Pope. Monsignor Bunny, Bishop of Antwerp, and the visible head of the bishops who allow the blessing of same-sex couples, has again insisted in an interview that Pope Francis, with whom he has spoken twice on the issue, is not opposed to such a ceremony. At the March meeting of the German Synodal Way in Frankfurt, he made a big impression with his statement, which reiterated what he had said before, that Pope Francis accepts the blessing of same-sex couples. For his extraordinary services to the renewal of Catholic doctrine on marriage, the family, and other forms of relationship and life, he will receive an honorary doctorate from the University of Bonn. I have spoken personally with the Pope twice about these questions, Monsignor Boni said in an interview. I know from my conversations what my relationship with Pope Francis is like. They were personal conversations. I won't say publicly what and how he said something, but I know that neither I nor we are against the Pope. Rome has a Latin influence in all areas. Germany is Germanic just as we are in Flanders. This is a big difference. In Rome, for example, they say, you can do it, 
but you must not say it. With us, on the other hand, what you do and what you say must coincide as far as possible, said the Belgian prelate. On the other hand, the Bishop of Essen, one of the most ardent supporters of the German Synod, has announced that his diocese is expected to have fewer than 30 priests by 2040. In that diocese, only 2.4% of those who remain officially Catholic attend Sunday Mass, or less than 17,000 people. Jennifer Roback, founder of the Ruth Association for the Victims of the Sexual Revolution, denies that homosexuality is genetic. At this moment in history, the Catholic Church is the last man standing for this traditional belief that is the common heritage of the entire Judeo-Christian world. It would be a pity if the church were to throw in a towel just at a time when science is proving that it was right all along, says Robach. The available science does not allow us to say that people are born gay. We are fooled by ideology masquerading as science. We are systematically told that science says that being gay is an innate and immutable trait in an individual that is beyond their power to change. Therefore, to hold people morally responsible is cruel, unreasonable, and worst of all, outdated and unscientific. The Catholic Church, they add, must abandon its ancient teaching that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered in order to keep up with the most modern findings of science. But what if science says no such thing? The available science analyzing the human genome clearly says there is no genetic basis for a homosexual identity. The study's lead author told the New York Times that it is basically impossible to predict a person's sexual activity or orientation from genetics alone. The study found that a person's developmental environment, the influence of diet, family, friends, neighborhood, religion, and a host of other life conditions was twice as influential as genetics in a likelihood of adopting same-sex behavior or orientation. Homosexual people are not genetically different from all other human beings in any meaningful sense. Our editorial this week is devoted to commenting on the apostasy of a young German man frustrated that the Synod did not achieve what he wanted. A few days ago, the co-president of the German Synod, by the name of Irma, said that she was not willing, I imagine, neither she nor the lady participating in the Synodal Committee. She was not willing for the bishops to continue to have the power to veto the implementation of the conclusions of the Synod, a power that was established in the Synodal organization itself, which required two-thirds of the vote of the participating bishops. The truth is that this veto was only being used on one occasion. Only in one occasion was it possible for two-thirds of the bishops to oppose one of the things approved by the Synod. And I say it was only on one occasion because from that moment on they modified on the flight voting rule of the Senate and it was decided that everyone had to vote by a show of hands so that their vote will be public. From that moment on, the quote unquoted, brave German bishops with very few exceptions submitted to what the majority wanted it because they knew perfectly well what awaited them when they returned to their diocese in the form of criticism, harassment, demonstration, or perhaps who knows what might come out of the closet. The fact is that from that moment on, the secret bullet ended, which firstly was the Senate's regulation. And secondly, it is the norm in any vote. The Mr. Irma, the co-president who is in charge, decided that everything had to be done by a show of hands, by a show of hands, 
a style more typical of dictatorships, be it Slayton's or Hitler. Well, now Mr. Irma is tired of having to raise her hand and in the voting. She is tired and finds it all very aesthetic and has decided to put an end to the possibility of the bishops being able to veto any application of what has already been approved in the Senate. She who rules the rules. This is, of course, leaves the bishops in a place absolutely distinction when it comes to carry out their canonical mission of governing, but nevertheless, it does not seem to have been enough for one of the leaders of the German Catholic youth of gay sectors. I do not know if it is that he is gay and leader, or it is that he is a leader of the gay sector. Well, the fact is that these young men from the diocese of Munster, named Lucas, have decided to ap apostatize from the church and has made it public. He is leaving the church. He is no longer a Catholic because he says that he feels the words in his own own. For the record, he feels impotent. I imagine that by impotent, he means that he feels frustrated and disappointed. Well, the fact is that Lucas is leaving the church, but he has said that he is going to continue working. The word working is a figure of a speech. Eh? So that none of those who really work will get upset. That he is going to continue working within this commission of the Diocese of Munster in which he has part as a Catholic leader. He is a Catholic leader at the head of the Catholic youth, but he is no longer a Catholic. And of course, the Diocese of Munster has said that, of course, it will be great, and that this work will continue to be remunerated with a generous salary. It is difficult to understand outside of Germany that a person does not pay taxes. The key is there, that they declared him an apostate, that they did not allow him, for example, to celebrate a funeral or a relative or when the time comes for himself, but that nevertheless no one is an apostate can be at the head of the young German Catholics. Difficult to understand. Of course, maybe the question is in which part of the church you are. Now, why has Lucas left the church? I repeat, the word that he is in his impotent. He feels frustrated. And whose fault it is? And what will Mrs. Irma, the co-president who decides and rules, do? What will she do if she does not get her way? If in the end the bishops decided that they are not going to give up their bit of power, surely they will give in. But well, let us suppose that they decide that they will not give in. And what will Mrs. Irma do? Will she also declare herself an apostate and throw herself out of the church? Lucas is now the first case. There have been others before and of the people with important positions, even priests and even episcopal, episcopal vicars within the church who have left frustrated, disappointed. And whose fault it is? There is because they thought they could achieve things that are impossible to achieve or those who decided deceive them and encourage them to ask for something, telling them that with media support, which they have not locked, and with a sufficient number of votes, they could turn around everything that was needed in the church. Sexual morality, sacraments, even doctrine. Whose fault it is? We are facing such a serious situation. What happened in Germany is only the beginning, but it is spreading in the giant steps. We are in such a serious situation, the validity, the usefulness, 
not only for the German Senate or of the Senate of Synodality, but of any Senate, is being questioned. The listening process is very important for the hierarchy. It is very useful both for the Pope in the previous synods, where the bishops were listened to, and in the new synods, where bishops and laity are going to be listened to. It's very important for the hierarchy to know what the bishops think or to know what the people of God thinks. It is very important to listen. The work of listening never hurts, taking from granted that this listening is representative of all the people of God and not of an ideologized minority that has taken control of the initial phrases of this listening process. Listening is very important, but everyone must know from the beginning, and I say everyone. Those who listen to those who want to be listened to. Everyone must know from the beginning that there are things that will not be changed because they cannot, they cannot and should not be changed. From then on, we talk and listen. But I repeat, everyone must know that there are things that will not be changed. Now, if this is so, should the listening have been done as it has been done? Or should, I, should, should it have been made very clear from the beginning what are the limits of what is untouchable? For example, Synod of the Amazon, Synod of the Amazon, where the ordination of married men is required, or an overwhelming majority. Well, this is required in the Synod of the Amazon, and what happened? Well, married men have not been ordained either for the Amazon or for any other place. Hasn't that generated frustration among those who participated in that synod? Surely yes. It is possible that some have left the church and have not published it on their Twitter account, as the young German gay Lucas has done, perhaps because they did not have a Twitter account in the Amazon. I don't know. There may be some. In any case, we are facing a process that can generate immense frustration among those who expect to achieve changes and will not occur. And if they were to occur, and if those changes at the all, those labels demanded by the Germans and not only by them, and if those changes were to take place, then perhaps the young Lucas will stop feeling impotent in the sense of frustrated, I mean, and he will go back to the Catholic Church, from which he has somehow never left because he has continued working for a, as a head of the young Catholics and receiving his salary. Well, maybe Lucas will be very happy and will go back to work and to be part of the Catholic Church, but there will be many others who will feel devastated because they could have to choose between being faithful to Christ and faithful to the church that up to now was Jesus' church. The solid fact of having studied the possibility, the possibility of changing certain things that cannot and should not be changed. Just the possibility is causing a huge pain, unspeakable. Only God knows all the pain all these people is suffering, so many Catholics, because of what is happening, because of the confusion reigning at this time. They did not know, and they did not realize the pain of millions of Catholics. I ask God that this situation ends as soon as possible, but I also ask Him, and I do it every day, for those responsible for this confusing and this pain. Maybe some of them, I say this sincerely, already don't believe in God, or don't believe in a Catholic God, or they made up a custom God, or made the, may, maybe they even think there is not eternal life, that everyone is saved, that there is not judgment, 
or that mercy loves a judgment and one can do whatever one desires. It, it is possible because right now anything is. God exists and those who have to make people suffer even if they think they won't, they will face God who will hold them accountable for the immense damage they are causing. Every day, really, I pray for them. I pray for them. I pray for the church and I pray for those suffering. See you next week, God willing. We will continue to keep you informed of what is happening in the church. In the meantime, you can check our website at www.magnificat.tv. See you next week, God willing.